Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Yesterday, Joe Biden gave a speech where he argued that President Trump incites violence instead of stopping it. And instead of proving Biden wrong, Trump proved him right just a few hours later. Yes, we have seen peaceful protests across the country. Yes, we have seen violence erupt in some cities. And yes, we have seen the president try to paint all of it with the same brush. Why? Because it plays right into his hands. He knows that. That's why he tries to capitalize on it and why he tries to encourage it. Here he is describing Portland, Oregon. Or a city like Portland, where the, the entire city is ablaze all the time. No matter how many times the president watches Fox News loop video of a fire in Portland, this is nonsense. The local fire chief told CNN fact checker Daniel Dale that the city is not ablaze. And for the isolated pockets of fires that broke out during demonstrations, they're on, they've only needed one fire engine for them. Portland's been burning for many years. For decades, it's been burning. And I think the people of Portland, and they're tired of it. They're tired of having, uh, of living with this curse. Again, nonsense, but nonsense that is easy to pedal to a host who endlessly airs video from June of fires in Minneapolis or police standoffs in Seattle from July and tries to pass them off as if they happened in late August. If you watch her show, you would think Portland has been burning for years, but it hasn't been burning for years, let alone decades, as the president claims. Now listen to this as Trump also spins lies about his record on crime. Since the beginning of Operation Legend, we have conducted more than 1,000 arrests and reduced the murder rate in Kansas City, which is one of the cities we targeted, by one-third, headed down 33 percent. That's completely made up. Murders have not declined 33 percent there, according to data obtained by the Kansas City Star. The city has recorded 135 homicides this year, putting it on track to be the deadliest year on record. There have been 32 homicides since the operation was announced in July. But as the president paints this picture of an out-of-control America, he acts like he's not already the president of it. I'll appoint more tough on crime prosecutors, support stiffer penalties and longer jail terms for riders, and support effective policing methods that are proven to be great crime reducers. When you enforce the law, order follows, and we need order. We need, we need order. While I am president, we will defend the rights of law-abiding citizens. We will honor the heroes who keep America safe. He is the president right now, and he has been for almost three years. The crime that he's deriding is happening on his watch. He's stoking it and using it successfully in many cases to make Americans afraid. The violence is fueled by dangerous rhetoric from far left politicians that demonize our nation and demonize our police. When the rioters come for your town and they're coming, Will Biden and his team do enough to stop them? These are thugs out there attacking law-abiding citizens. Since these are people are now crossing state lines, clearly, and this is being organized using the Internet, they will burn down your cities and tell you that you did it. 
And if you don't accept that judgment, maybe they'll send BLM to your house. That is a host saying that you should be afraid because black people might be coming to your house to commit violence. It's blatant racism. It's meant to scare moderate Americans into voting for President Trump. There's a standardized political reaction to violence, and it is to condemn it. And that's the route that Joe Biden took yesterday. I'll be very clear about all of this. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. Setting fires is not protesting. None of this is protesting. It's lawlessness, plain and simple. And those who do it should be prosecuted. Instead of condemning violence, President Trump is endorsing it. Here is what he said about Portland, where a right-wing protester was shot and killed this weekend. He was part of a caravan of Trump supporters driving through the downtown protests, some of those supporters shooting paintballs, and according to a witness I interviewed, marbles from paintball guns. You were just criticizing Joe Biden, saying he didn't mention the far left or Antifa. During his speech today, you said you wanted to talk about left-wing political violence. Yeah. But I noticed you did not mention that your supporters were also in Portland this weekend, firing paintball guns at people, some form of pepper spray. So do you want to also take this chance to condemn what your supporters did? Well, I understand they had large numbers of people that were supporters, but that was a peaceful protest. And paint is not, and paint is a defensive mechanism. Now, that death in Portland is not okay. The president, though, is greenlighting his supporters to show up at protests and shoot paintballs at protesters. He's saying that's peaceful behavior, but he's also greenlighting his supporters to show up with bullets. He is defending the 17-year-old in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who allegedly shot and killed two people with an AR-15-style gun and wounded a third. That was an interesting situation. You saw the same tape as I saw. And uh, he was trying to get away from them, I guess, it looks like. And he fell. And then they very violently attacked him. And it was something that we're looking at right now, and it's under investigation. But uh, I, I guess he was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed. But it's under, it's under investigation. According to police, that 17-year-old suspect in Kenosha allegedly shot someone, ran, and people from the crowd chased him. The president of the United States essentially is saying it's okay to take up arms without training or credentials or authority, go into the streets and act out a video game with protesters. But even if people are in the streets, breaking the law, rioting and looting, it is not the role of a private citizen to police them and to shoot them. That's not how the, how the president of the United States sees it. He, he immediately had to retreat from that, from that area because, because the, 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 the mob that was the rioters that were chasing him, uh, who had witnessed this, immediately called him out um, uh, for the shooting, uh, which of course wasn't self-defense, but they called him out for the shooting. That's the attorney for the suspect saying they called him out. Well, they is law enforcement, the shooter, is now facing multiple homicide charges. And in New York City, the police commissioner is warning against bringing a gun to a protest like the shooter did in Kenosha. Probably the last thing we would want to see here. Around the streets, I, I just, I feel for my law enforcement brothers and sisters across the country dealing with that. And, and, I, and I would liken it to almost, Jim, it's a, uh, a powder keg and, and throwing a match on. It's just so incredibly volatile already. Palmer heads and leaders, the president is not either here. The president is arguing that he is the law and order candidate, but he clearly supports neither. He says he is the candidate who can combat violence, but he isn't against violence. He's against black violence. He's just fine with white violence, it appears. Joining me now is CNN contributor Miles Taylor. He served as chief of staff at the Department of Homeland Security under the Trump administration. He is supporting Joe Biden in November. Miles, when you hear what the president is saying, uh, is it something that you worry could embolden people to take up arms against protesters and rioters? Or do you think that people will be smart and they won't do that? Well, thanks, Brianna. I mean, I would say this. It's beyond worry at this point. I think that the likeliest outcome 
is that the president's rhetoric will be hijacked by people for these reasons. And I'll go a step further. I talked to law, law enforcement officials that I used to serve with in the administration on an almost daily basis. They are very concerned behind the scenes about the president's rhetoric and its ability to fan the flames of further unrest. Uh, you had the police commissioner just say from New York that this is a powder keg. I likened it earlier today uh, to the president arranging kindling with his words that will turn into a nationwide brush fire uh, if Joe Biden wins. He's trying to set the stage uh, for more unrest uh, to show that you know he's the legitimate uh, heir to a second term as president, even if he doesn't win it. This is very concerning. This is rhetoric we've never seen out of a modern president uh, in U.S. history. So yes, law enforcement officials are concerned, and they should be, because we've already seen Donald Trump's rhetoric jump the tracks into violence in the past, and, and he's laying the groundwork for that in the near future. It is Wednesday, the 2nd of September of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is... Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Just a lovely hollandaise sauce on an equally lovely egg dish. And it is not cloying. It is not heavy. No, it is in the Manhattan style if you need some specifics. Indeed. Well, also, you know, to go on with the uh, theme of the day of Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, we should also uh, wonder who will rid us of these meddlesome priests. And boy, are there a lot of them still. You know, you got your Falwell Juniors, and they're kind of toppling like a redwood. And you got your Jim Bakers, who seems like a zombie. He just keeps coming back to life, eating people's brains. Wow. So, you know, I and they just keep coming back. I, I, I don't know what we're going to do. And, and then, then those who, well, <laughs> you got a Falwell Junior. So he came from a Falwell Senior. <sighs> when will it stop? Well, we will find a way to rid us, ourselves of these meddlesome priests. There will be a separation of church and state. And we all should have our Second Amendment rights to bear soup. Okay. In fact, I, David David earlier came up with, a, I, I don't know if he came up with it, but he, he mentioned uh, regiments of parasupers. And I'd like to know where the recruitment office is for the Antifa parasupers because I want to be there. I did mention last night on social media, though, that all the Antifa super soldiers that I know make their soup from scratch. Which then, I guess, means that uh, the ATF is going to start uh, investigating and maybe arresting a lot of home cooks o across America. Have you been making soup? Do you can it? Yeah, but it's in jazz. That's even worse. Anyway, no one's throwing soup. I also mentioned I did run a retort cooker when I was in college, seasonally, at uh, the Sandy Am Cannery in the, in the Willamette Valley near Salem. And um, uh, many for many seasons, actually. And no one's throwing Kansas soup. Now, they will throw the cream corn, especially if you've ever worked in a cannery. You will not eat some of the products that come out of there. Really. Uh, green beans were always my favorite to throw. And uh, I, I always thought, you know, throwing the 603 cans, that's, you know, the big, the big ones. I always thought that was like the, you know, the true sign of manlyhood. But you can throw your shoulder out if you're not careful. So, you know, stick with the 303 and the 403 cans. All right. Fit around your hand a lot better. I don't know. Sometimes the 303 cans, you know, that's the, like the regular soup can. Um, I, I, it's more like a dart to me, you know, rather than a baseball or something. Though it has enough heft. I uh, <laughs> I was in the 7-Eleven in the Elmwood 7-Eleven right there on uh, College Avenue. Is that is that Stewart? I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, and there was a guy in there mugging. I, I don't know if he was trying to rob the place. He had a knife. Now, I don't know what I would have done with a gun. I think with a gun, you know, things can be a lot more unforgiving if you make a mistake. You, you don't want to be a hero with someone with a gun necessarily. I mean, look what happened with that kid with a skateboard. Now they're calling him the aggressor. Anyway, I pegged this guy in the back of the head with a can of green beans and he went down. 
I was behind him. He didn't know, you know, he's mugging the counter person and, and, uh, other people standing at the counter had no idea that I was there. So I don't know. I just winged it pretty hard. I used to have a pretty good arm and fairly accurate. And I pegged him right in the back of the head and the guy went down. So, you know, I can understand where Trump might be coming up with the idea of bags of soup. But that's also something that is in the fever swamps of uh, busloads of Black Lives Matter Antifa apparently going to planes and bringing in onto the plane. Now, now, no one questions this. Black clad, goth looking, apparently, Black Lives Matter Antifa super soldiers have been packing planes carrying baseball bats, chainsaws and bags of soup. And they let them on the plane. I couldn't carry a six ounce cup of espresso on a plane. Oh, no, you can't take that. That's a liquid. And they're carrying bags of soup, baseball bats and chainsaws in the fuselage. They were scary. So, you know, anybody who believes that BS, <laughs> I guess that means that you're a Republican. Which brings me to our little burg of Rogue River, Oregon. You know, people will tell you here in Rogue River, Oregon, we help everybody. We're not racist. You know, it's true. Rogue River, Oregon itself is not racist. You know, it's like calling a building a racist. But there's sure a lot of racists in the building. My God. So we had our uh, our uh, Southern Oregon racial equality uh, uh, march. Well, it got turned into something completely different. I also like the acronym of the Southern Oregon racial equality group, SOAR. We're kind of SOAR about the fact that there's a lot of racism in Southern Oregon. Just don't call them racist. And Rogue River, Oregon exemplified that sentiment to a T. Indeed. So uh, I mentioned uh, earlier this week, and it's only in the middle of the week, <laughs> that that the uh, local papers have been reporting on our little burg of Rogue River. And, of course, it has been picked up worldwide to the point where the moderator on the Rogue River town page on Facebook, which has really nothing to do with the city, you know, the city or town itself of Rogue River. It's just that it's looked at as being the the voice of Rogue River, not city council voice, but you know, the voice of Rogue River. So of course, you know, this is a town page that has routinely silenced every liberal voice, drove them away with death threats or whatever. Right. So because, uh, they, that Facebook page, uh, there was some credible threats. Uh, you know, let's just say that when you go on Facebook and say, you're going to plug a biracial grandkid of a local resident in the head with a bullet, you know, that, 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 that's a little over the top. You would think that violated terms of use. But who was banned? The grandmother with the biracial kid for, you know, sh stirring up the shit, I think is how the neighbors called it. There's all these people just stirring up the shit. We're such a nice town. We're so peaceful. They were so peaceful. They brought out 300 biker, proud boy types. You know, a lot of gray beers. Let's just put it that way. With motorcycles and uh, power boats on trailers that they revved up, so the the uh, the march was originally going to begin at City Hall on on Main Street. Actually, it's Broadway. Then they were going to go up, probably by the museum, and then but they could have gone up uh, Main Street nonetheless. Then crossed. Uh, Whatever that is. West Evans? Yeah, West Evans. East Evans. I don't know. <laughs> they would have crossed where where the uh, uh, the bank is. Anyway, they were going to go to the Arboretum, Palmerton Park, and then have a barbecue there. But the city wouldn't allow them a, a parade permit. They would not allow them. Well, actually... The city has nothing to do with uh, who gets a lot, you know, who gets to rent Palmerton Park. It's on a first come, first serve basis. So somebody in City Hall called up their friends in the right wing movement and said, you better get down here and reserve that park because we got a lot of outside agitators, busloads of outside agitators coming here. And somebody did. So then uh, uh, the group 
Southern Oregon Racial Equality decided to rent the Evans Evans Community, Evans Valley Community Center, which is in Weimer, Wimmer, Weimer. Some people call it Weimer. Some people call it Wimmer. I like to call it the Vima. Anyway, uh, but uh, that facility had bomb threats and death threats directed its way. And so they said, nah, maybe we don't want to get involved in this. So it turned out to be just a gathering of about 100, 150 people who are, you know, willing to go out and make themselves visible for racial equality. And they were going to have, a, you know, a little bit of a speaking thing and then, you know, call it a day. Can't have a barbecue now. And uh, uh, while they were doing that, uh, about 300 counter protesters decided that they would uh, rev their engines and, you know, glass packs in their big old mega trucks. They had the uh, rolling smoke people. I mentioned that before. But the boats, the people with speed boats and power boats that came and revved up those loud engines. Oh, man. So, you know, I suppose that if you're going to have a a gathering about racial equality in Southern Oregon and people come out and protest that, what make what does that make them? <laughs> Loving, peaceful neighbors. And then these same idiots had the audacity to say, well, why don't those people just like stop? Why don't they just go to a barbecue and talk about it there? Well, they were trying to. Okay. But there's so many racists in Rogue River that they were prevented from doing so. So as a result, uh, the moderator on the Facebook page has decided that now there's going to be some sort of vetting procedure that, uh, you know, prevents people from just joining willy nilly this page because apparently, you know, uh, I, I think, I, I don't know. I haven't, you know, I've been suspended, <laughs> so I don't hang out on Facebook very much, but apparently, apparently, the little Rogue River tete tete has made somewhat of the national and international news cycle, and people are kind of bugging people in Rogue River, River for being racist. And no one who is a racist ever wants to hear that. And so now there's a, a canceling procedure so that they don't have to hear that. To the point that even if you live in town, which is supposed to be part of the deal, you have to live in town if you want to be a part of this page. Um, but if you're a shitster, meaning a liberal, goodbye. Well, who needs that little town page anyway? And I'm glad that it's been exposed. They're going to pay the price and people ought to grow up, you know, just instead of whining that that, oh, well, they're they're calling me a racist. Well, stop whining about, oh, well, if you're worried about being called a racist, stop being one then. I don't know. All right. I could go on and on about that, and I have. So what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast? Cookbook and Speakeasy, the Trump administration, is seeking to fast-track environmental reviews of dozens of major drilling, mining, and other hazardous projects during the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, I should mention that the rhetoric at the top, we had the rhetoric in the Trump echo chamber about protests and violence in the U.S. is blatant racism. It is. Continuing on in the uh, Bistro Cafe, uh, police unions and other law enforcement organizations went into overdrive to defeat a California bill on removing problem cops because they don't want to remove problem cops, especially the problem cops. Don't call them problem cops. They'll hate you for it. And Bill Barr tightened the rules on surveillance of political candidates caught in counterintelligence investigations of hostile foreign powers compromising political candidates like Trump. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Austria filed charges against a Turkish spy. And the Norwegian parliament suffered a significant cyber attack. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
Radio.com to the right and shove the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. And that chat room link is right over there by the social media scroll. So it's all there. All there. If you would then take a gander to the left ish of the page from the chat room link that happens to be near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then hopefully notice our link to our Patreon page and do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. Those who have done so have been, well, they pledged a certain amount of money, usually around the cost of an espresso-type coffee drink, and that comes to us once a month. We pay our bills. We accumulate the funds because, you know, machinery is made to break down really fast these days. So we have to buy some newish machinery and the attendant software that goes with it, and their generosity has been allowing us to really, you know, knock off a big chunk of what we need to do to get what we need to get to pay for all of that. But we need more of you to be able to do that. And if you could, in these times of peril, afford a coffee-type drink, uh, espresso-type, uh, and send it our way, we are able to stretch those dollars beyond compare. We've been doing it for almost 10 years, indeed, of continuous, 24-7, 365 continuous resistance radio, as the founders originally intended. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And also, you know, when you go to our homepage, the scroll at the top, thank you, Tom, for getting all that. We are standing with Black Lives Matter, and we also vote, and we want you to as well. We have to vote, so let's do it. Thank you, Tom, for putting that scroll up there. And, you know, we're marking a line in the sand, even if the sand happens to be the pavement of the Portland streets. Indeed. Okay, if you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Did I mention follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, because I post the show, show notes and links diary on Daily Goes about 10 minutes before showtime. And then I get that out on social media for everybody to social media about. Okay, let's dive into this first offering <clears throat> since the, the morning rant went pretty long. Oh, my. Well, I had to fill you in on what's happening in Rogue River because I believe it's emblematic emblematic of a particular sentiment in small town America, unfortunately, but it's heartening to see that we liberals will not be cowed. You know, not all of us can make a physical presence, but we do have a digital life too. And it bothers them so much. They're trying to cancel us. (laughs) Let them try. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Matthew Brown. The Trump administration is seeking to fast track environmental reviews of dozens of major energy and infrastructure projects during the COVID-19 pandemic, including oil and gas drilling hazardous fuel pipelines, wind farms, okay, that's cool, I guess, and highway projects in multiple states. And that's according to documents provided to the AP. Oh, you mean they're trying to keep it secret from us? Why would they do that? The plan to speed up project approvals comes after Trump in June ordered the Interior Department and other agencies to scale back environmental reviews under special powers he has during the coronavirus emergency. Oh, now it's not a hoax. Funny how that works, huh? More than 60 projects targeted for expedited environmental reviews were detailed in an attachment to a July 15th letter from Assistant Interior Secretary Catherine McGregor to White House economic advisor and, I don't know, whiskey and cocaine, or is it gin? Larry Kudlow. The letter, obtained by the Center for Biological Diversity through a freedom of, um, freedom of information lawsuit. Boy, they got to get rid of those, huh? Does not specify how the review process would be hastened. It says the specified energy, environmental, and natural resource projects are within the authority of the Secretary of the Interior to perform or advance. Well, if the pandemic doesn't kill you, 
the environmental pollution will. us this next offering here the bistro cafe of west coast cookbook and speakeasy smothered benedict wednesdays police unions and other law enforcement organizations went into overdrive to thwart a measure that would have added california to the majority of states that can end the careers of officers with troubled histories no you got to keep them around it failed as lawmakers scrambled to wrap up their work, and we're talking about a Democratic majority. What the hell? And uh, while the nation's most populous state still has no way to permanently remove problematic officers, a number of other police reforms did pass, though. With lobbyists and lawmakers mostly isolated by the pandemic, it became a battle of phone calls, colorful graphics, and Instagram posts from law enforcement organizations to counter celebrity tweets pushing lawmakers to rein in police brutality after the death of George Floyd last May and the shooting of Jacob Blake last week. We ended up, for lack of a better term, a game of whack-a-mole, Tom Segal, a spokesman for the police unions in Los Angeles and San Francisco, said of law enforcement's efforts to counter support for what he called a deeply flawed proposal. Yeah, you know what? You know what's a deeply flawed proposal or actual uh, practice? It's a goddamn police officer's bill of rights. Why, why, why? <laughs> I you know, I often wonder how, how it is that that the conservative mind, whenever they hear equal rights, they think that rights are being taken from them to make it equal for others. Because they afford themselves special rights to begin with. Cops have special rights. You can't know if this cop has beat the crap out of his wife. You can't know how many times a cop's plugged somebody in the head with a thirty eight revolver. Or, I don't know, do they use a 9mm now? What is it? Or how about cops through internal affairs who have been caught planting evidence? Etc., etc., etc. You can't know about any of that. And it doesn't follow them on their their paperwork when they apply for jobs elsewhere. Though they, you know, I got to tell you, some enterprising police chiefs can find out and do. And if they think that it warrants to get rid of that particular cop, they get rid of them. Or how about when cops have to piss in a jar, which they rarely have to do, and it comes out that they were on steroids? Do we get to keep those around? We don't get to know about it at all. California tried to join the majority of states of trying to rein in this lack of accountability. And the police unions and law enforcement organizations, instead of compromising and negotiating in a representative democratic government, decided to play whack-a-mole. The legislation would have created a way to permanently strip badges from officers who commit serious misconduct. Law enforcement groups successfully argued that the proposed system would be biased and lack basic due process protections. Pros proposals to reveal more police misconduct records require officers to intervene if they witness excessive use of force and limit their use of rubber bullets and tear gas against peaceful protesters also died without final votes. Lawmakers, however, sent new some measures to ban chokeholds and other neck restraints, require the state attorney general to investigate fatal police shootings of unarmed civilians, and increase oversight of county sheriffs, among a few other minor changes.
brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Justice Department, not my music show, not to be confused with that, please, announced new restrictions uh, for conducting any national security surveillance of candidates for federal office or their staff members and advisors, like, you know, Kislyak, Deripaska, others. The restrictions announced by William Barr in a pair of memos. Oh, more OLC memos out the back of his pocket. Uh, part of a broader changes are part of a broader changes to the FBI surveillance procedures implemented in response to problems during the 2016 investigation into ties between Russia and Trump's campaign. Coming just two months before the presidential election, the changes are designed to ensure that law enforcement officials have to clear additional hurdles before pursuing the same type of surveillance as was conducted four years ago on a former advisor to Trump's 2016 campaign. But what we're talking about is that Trump and all these other yahoos were caught in counterintelligence investigations wholly separate from the Trump campaign of 2016 and i am sorry when you're making deals with hostile foreign powers to take over america and you've been and that hostile foreign power has been working here for quite a while to do so and people have gone to jail for it charged with espionage our law enforcement agencies take that very seriously But because of the problems that arose in 2016, in other words, Trump got caught, Bill Barr is going to make it harder for Trump to get caught again? We're not talking about Bill Barr preventing surveillance of candidates other than Donald Trump, and we know that because we know Bill Barr. John Mitchell Bill Barr. Now, more than ever. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, double the fun. For an actor best known for buddy movies, Seth Rogen shows that his best co-star may be himself. In his new movie, An American Pickle, he plays both main characters. Based on the 2013 New Yorker short story, The Sellout, an American Pickle, it tells the tale of Herschel Greenbaum, an Eastern European immigrant who comes to America with his wife in the 19-teens. Herschel gets a job in a pickle factory, but his fate would have it, falls into a pickle barrel, only to wake up a hundred years later perfectly preserved. With his wife and son long gone, Herschel discovers his only living relative is a great-grandson, Ben, an app developer living in Brooklyn. Ben invites Herschel to stay with him, but the two men quickly learn that they have very different philosophies of life. Ben, who's developing an app and expecting a big payoff, is a disappointment to Herschel, who doesn't really understand Ben's efforts. As it turns out, Herschel is a natural entrepreneur and sets up an artisan pickle stand, which becomes a huge hit with Brooklyn hipsters. Despite the family ties, the two men become rivals with Ben determined to undermine Herschel's success. Hilarity ensues, but as the cartoonishly contrived setup sort of suggests, the movie's true calling is as a fish-out-of-water comedy that relishes taking swipes at cultural issues and especially at family expectations in a uniquely Jewish context. Rogan shows that he's becoming a versatile actor who's come a long way since Apatow movies. Director Brandon Trost makes the most of the Brooklyn setting, and Simon Rich's screenplay stays true to the themes of the original story that he authored. An American Pickle is an offbeat little film that works, maybe because it doesn't venture too deeply into weeds that are all around. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube.
This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, ask your health care provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Colorectal cancer is the number two cancer killer of men and women in the United States, but it is preventable. Early on, colorectal cancer typically has no symptoms. It starts with a precancerous polyp or abnormal growth in the colon, which can be removed without surgery. Several tests are available to find these polyps, so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Screening also finds colorectal cancer early when treatment works best. Recommended screening for adults at average risk begins at age 50 and continues until age 75. Learn about screening test options and find out which tests are covered by insurance. Talk to your health care provider about when you should be screened and discuss the best test for you. For more information about colorectal cancer prevention, please visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to netrootsradio.com, show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Freedom of expression is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. One benefit of freedom of expression is that it helps to maintain representative democracy. For example, individual citizens participate in running our country by electing their representatives to Congress and other government officials. Citizens can also participate in making decisions about government policies. To make wise choices, you need to have good information. Free expression does not guarantee complete or accurate information, but it increases the chances of getting such information. Another benefit of freedom of expression is that it helps to bring about peaceful social change. Freedom of expression allows you to try to influence public opinion by persuasion without feeling you have to resort to violence to make changes. Also, if you have the opportunity to express your opinions freely, you might be more willing to accept government decisions, even decisions you do not agree with. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. Earlier this year, President Donald Trump labeled the United States Postal Service a joke. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Let's start with a factual correction. The Postal Service has been a lifeline of democracy in the United States since it was established in 1775 by the Second Continental Congress with Benjamin Franklin as the first Postmaster General. After the American Revolution, the Constitution, as adopted, and as it remains today, specifies as one of Congress's enumerated powers the power to establish post offices and post roads. In this pivotal election year, shaped by a global pandemic, 
There is nothing remotely funny about the administration's plans and actions to gut the Postal Service, which is essential to the timely delivery of ballots, not to mention the delivery of census data, COVID supplies, and needed prescriptions, among other things. The House of Representatives has passed the Delivering for America Act, which would prevent the administration from gutting the Postal Service and pay for the Postal Service to maintain its previous levels of service until the COVID crisis has passed. Saving our Postal Service will promote the general welfare and help secure the blessings of liberty. And so the Senate should pass, and the President should sign the Delivering for America Act. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. With our national election looming, someone should put up lost dog signs in every neighborhood saying, Missing Republican Party Platform. Voters won't find one, though, for this so-called major political party has decided not to produce a specific statement of what it stands for this year, nor will it offer to voters an itemized set of policies its public officials would try to enact if elected. Indeed, the GOP hierarchy is so disdainful of the electorate that it says the party will not present a platform until 2024. Yes, four years after the election. They've even imposed their policy silence on their own grassroots delegates, decreeing that any attempt by them to adopt new platform proposals at the National Republican Convention would be, quote, ruled out of order. Instead of a political party, the GOP of 2020 has become a pathetic puppet show of weakling officials and sycophantic subordinates being jerked around by the maniacal whims of a bloated ego with despotic fantasies. Thus, the once respectable Republican National Committee has meekly ceded its authority, duty, respect, and relevance to a single unhinged authoritarian. In essence, they're saying that the platform and the party itself is one word, Trump. Whatever poppycock the glorious leader utters today, whomever he attacks tomorrow, whichever fantastical conspiracy he embraces next week, the GOP will applaud, bow, and in unison reply, Amen! Sad. Republican senators, governors, captains of industry, elders, and others who once had power, prominence, some prestige, and maybe even a little pride, now meekly wear Trump's collar and kowtow to his conceits, leaving an entire party with the sole operating principle, what he said. This is Jim Hightower saying, that's not a party, it's a national embarrassment. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1974. That was the day that President Gerald Ford signed the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. The act was passed over growing concern about the mismanagement of private pension plans in the country. In 1963, the Studebaker Corporation closed its auto plant. Its pension plan was a mess. Nearly 7,000 workers received only 15% of their pension or nothing at all. Across the country, more and more workers were relying on private pensions. In 1960, 21.2 million workers had private pensions. By 1970, the number stood at 30 million. The funds in those pension plans had nearly tripled in that same decade to $138 billion. Ensuring the security of those pensions was essential for millions of workers and the stability of the economy. At the bill signing, President Ford explained, quote, dramatic growth in recent years has thrust private pension plans into a central role in determining how older Americans live in their retirement years. Yet this same growth in pension plans has brought with it a host of new problems. 
many workers have ultimately lost their benefits, even after relatively long service, because when they left jobs, they thereby gave up rights to hard-earned pension benefits. Others have sustained hardships because their companies folded with insufficient funds in the pension plan to pay promised pensions. In addition, some pension funds have been invested primarily for the benefit of the companies or plan administrators, not for the workers. It is essential to bring some order and humanity to this welter of different and sometimes inequitable retirement plans within private industry. President Ford signed the bill on Labor Day and outlined minimum standards for private pensions. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently... 59 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of nearly the same yesterday, about 100 to 103. So, you know, moderate, moderate tips. Sunny conditions should prevail throughout the day, and winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear skies tonight, low in the mid-60s. Winds can uh, winds will then shift out of the north northwest at 5 to 10, and mainly sunny tomorrow with highs near 103 to 106. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10. Confirmed coronavirus cases in Jackson County in down here in southern Oregon have now spiked to 821. Confirmed dead stand at 2. Don't have any uh, uh, reading on pollen locally, but the air quality index has increased in the region into the moderate range at 51 parts per million. And the daytime UV index remains high at 7. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30 inches, visibility is at 9 miles, and relative humidity is at 70%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 68 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 72 and sunny. Rome is 78 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 90 and fair. Kabul is 75 degrees and fair. Hong Kong is 81 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 81 and mostly cloudy with thunderstorm activity in the area and possible flash flooding. Sydney, Australia is 65 and clear. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 75 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Present anonymous worker bees, this time at Reuters, brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Austria will file charges against a person who has confessed to spying for Turkey's secret service, and authorities are investigating more suspected espionage activities 
its Minister of Interior said, warning Turkey, this would not be tolerated. This is about an exertion of influence by a foreign power in Austria, and this will in no way be accepted. Interior Secretary or uh, Carl Nehammer told a news conference yesterday, Tuesday. Turkey rejected the espionage accusations as baseless. They always do. There were clear indications of Turkish influence in Austria, said the Director General for Public Safety, Franz Ruf. The new findings came following extensive investigations by Austrian police after violent clashes between Turkish and Kurdish groups in Vienna in June. One person has fully confessed to having been recruited by the Turkish Secret Service to spy on other Turkish citizens or Austrian citizens with a Turkish migration background to then report to them or report them to the Turkish security authorities, Nehammer said. He added that the judiciary will file charges on suspicion of espionage. He gave no details about the person. Austria has found that more than 30 Austrians were detained in Turkey between 2018 and 2020 after entering the country and as indications that the Turkish Secret Service tried to recruit them. Turkish espionage has no place in Austria. There is no place for Turkish influence on liberty and fundamental rights in Austria. We will fight against it vehemently, Nehammer said. Turkish Foreign Minister spokesman Hami Askoy said Ankara rejected the baseless claims, adding the comments showed Vienna was unable to escape populist rhetoric and its anti-Turkey obsession. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers And even more anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Norwegian Parliament suffered a cyber attack during the past week, and the email accounts of several elected members as well as employees were hacked, the National Assembly and Counterintelligence Agency said. This has been a significant attack, said Marianne Andreessen, the parliament's non-elected chief administrator. A limited number of lawmakers and employees were impacted and have been informed, Andreessen told a news conference, although she declined to say how many. It is not known who was behind the attack or exactly what data had been extracted, she said. Gee, I wonder what may, what country's nearby. I wonder what... what country that uses Cyrillic in their written language. I wonder who that might be. (laughs) Several members and staff of Norway's main opposition Labour Party were affected. The Norwegian National Security Authority assisted in countering the attack. We have been involved for a few days, the NSA spokesman Trond Overstahl said. We are assisting Parliament with analysis and technical assistance. Efforts to halt the attack had... An immediate effect, said Andreessen. Well, good. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. And you do know we will meet up tomorrow because Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Les années passent Il est loin, là je tombe Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 